Hey everybody, welcome to the Morning Devo with Boo. I'm your host, Bo Ouellette. Yes, hair and all, I know, it's crazy. But hey, it's Friday. Hope you guys are doing well. You can always check out the archives of the devotions at my YouTube channel, Bo Ouellette. So just go to Bo Ouellette and you could find it on YouTube, take a peek at it, and go through the Bible. And that's the whole point of these devotions at Calvary Christian Fellowship, but they're for anybody on um, social media and beyond, you know, in the world. You can always just go through the Bible with me. And, uh, you know, for me, that's part of my testimony is just reading through the Bible and how just reading through the Bible itself really blew my mind. Um, It really um, took me back a little bit because as a as a growing up just in SoCal, you know, you have so many objections to Christianity and a lot of them are just based on what you hear, what we hear, you know, in whether it's our music or whether it's in mainstream media or whether it's in our, our parents or things like that. And we never actually bother to study it, to look into it, to see why this book is so, our collection of books is so uh, venerated by many and why um, it has impacted the world the way it has. And um, I I think you could see that it's it's pretty intense and pretty detailed and there's reasons for for everything that's in it. And uh, there is no easy kind of um, uh, one time objection that's that's uh, that uh, uh, I guess my point is, is that when I, before I knew Christ, you know, I'd always have this one thing I would go to, oh, I don't want to believe in God because of this. But, you know, that really is all blown out of the water if you just read it, you know, and I think that's the best thing probably we could do ever with this kind of media time is just sit and read and kind of go through it together. So, hey, welcome, everybody. So glad you're in the uh, House of Devo today, whether on YouTube stream or on the Facebook stream. Let's get into it. First Samuel chapter three, going through the Bible. We're in the book of Samuel now. We're dealing with this kid, Samuel. He's a kid, man. It's awesome. He's been dedicated to the Lord by his mom. Man, what an awesome heart the mom has. Hey, I want to dedicate my kid to the work of the temple and uh, the work of God. Remember the temple, the tabernacle, this place was going to be the tent of meeting. That's the whole point. God was actually going to dwell with the people of Israel. Yeah, his glory. Sure, a shielded glory at that, but it would be a glory of the Almighty would be present with the people of Israel. And with that came massive ramifications, right? God is holy. He he has to uphold righteousness as God. God can't diminish his righteousness, his perfection. So any imperfection around him will be judged, will be dealt with. And hence why we have the book of Leviticus, a sacrificial system, something to atone for people's sins. So this kid, Samuel, is going to be hanging out in this tent of meeting, in this place where we are to draw near to God, right? And it says, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. And I love that. He ministered before the Lord. Just think of that in your devotion. Hey, you know, I'm ministering before the Lord. You're doing what you're doing unto who? The Lord. Yeah, so you can see where in the New Testament, where famous passages like Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, 3, verse 21, which say, hey, do what you do unto the Lord, right? But when you see those passages, do what you do unto the Lord, right? For the glory of the Lord. It's this idea of we're serving before the Lord. That's where our mind's at. So even in this morning, hey, I want to serve. I want to minister, which just means to serve, right? I want to serve before the Lord. And he served under Eli. And that's important, under Eli. You know, a, a a rank and file. It doesn't mean Samuel was less of a person than Eli. This is where our society today has it wrong, right? It is okay to serve underneath someone else. It doesn't mean that you're less of a human being or dignity or things like that. It, it, it is... It is, there's character that's built when we serve underneath, right? If we are in a place of leadership and people are under us, hopefully we have served under people 
so we can understand the character qualities that we're looking for in those that serve underneath us, right? Because we've been there, right? We know what it takes. We know the, the heart, the humility, right? We know that kind of attitude that needs to be there, that one of being fat, faithful, available, teachable, ready to go, you know, those kind of things. That way you become a good leader, right? You become a leader who remains faithful, available, teachable. You develop character. And this is what I think Samuel is going to learn. And it's cool. He's under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Okay, not many visions, not many insights, right, into spiritual matters. And again, we remember the book of Judges, right? Immediately before this time of Samuel, Samuel's the last judge, so to speak. And I tell you what, right? It was a pretty dark time, not too good. And so um, not many visions going on. And it says one night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak, he could barely see. He's an old guy. And lying down in his usual place, the dude liked to kick back in the same chair. It says, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And it says, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Isn't this cool? They're, they're in the tabernacle. They're keeping the lights on, right? Uh, and, you know, they're supposed to keep the lights on that's in this, this holy place. And Samuel's there, you know, you get the idea that he's close, lying down, kind of crawled up, resting in the temple where the Ark of the Lord was, wanting to be close to Levi, wanting to be close to God. Um, man, that's, that's a cool thing, right? Just lying there, being wanting to be close to God. And then the Lord called Samuel. So this is the contrast. The contrast is there's not many visions going on in Israel, and now Samuel's going to be called. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and laid down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. He called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, the word of the, or the, uh, did not know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now Samuel did not yet, oh, I read that. The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. And Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Samuel seems to not have had any, in a sense, special revelation or special vision or special understanding of the word of God, any maybe education into the word of God as of yet. But yet, at this early time, God keeps reaching out a third time, right? Again, threes in the Bible. That's a kind of an interesting thread throughout the scriptures. Three. And uh, it's neat that he gets called young, too. I, I kind of like that as well. Young lad, you know, hears from God and has this awesome kind of thing go on. You know, a special moment, if you will. And I think those, I th- you know, I want to have special moments uh, with God. And I seek those things. I don't know if you seek them or not. If you just go, hey, God, you know, show me something special. You know, give me a neat revelation. You know, um, you know, just open up my eyes, you know, to your word and to what your word's declaring, the depth of your death on the cross, the death, Jesus, the depth of your resurrection, the depth of your ascension, you know, the depth of that second coming of Christ, how it means, you know, Jesus said the whole Old Testament is about him. And reveal those things to me. You know, that kind of just neat touch, you know, from from God. Um, and so, um, and by the way, I love reading the comments. Thank you guys so much. I'm glad you're, you, you guys are ex-nurses. <laughs> you guys are helping me out with my mom. It's so awesome. Um, some people call Teladoc and some people just get on the D- Devo and then we go through the all the healthcare stuff on the comment corner. I love it. And so uh, it says, um, Eli realized that the boy was being called. And so Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there. This is interesting. The Lord came 
and stood there calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Very interesting, right? Very tiny little sentence. But again, another one that makes you go, hmm, this is interesting. God is outside of time. He's everywhere within time. And he also is standing right by Samuel. Very interesting. How can you have a God who's outside of time and at the same time be inside time everywhere and at the same time be a person on the earth? Hmm. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the Trinity's weaved all throughout the scriptures, and I've shown you guys that over and over and over and over. And we haven't even touched, we haven't gotten to the New Testament uh, from where we're at in our little narratives of Genesis on. All the way from, you know, Genesis, we've just seen the Trinity weaved in and out throughout the scriptures all the time. It's assumed. It's assumed. The God, the character of God is assumed in the scriptures, in the narrative. God is outside of time, God is everywhere in time, but yet God also can stand on the planet and still be outside of time and still be everywhere in time. Wow. Yep. And so the Lord came and stood there, huge, calling out at us other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. And the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, you know, the Lord, (laughs) <laughs> said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. Remember that? I, I just touched on it briefly, but there was this amazing prophecy about Eli and his sons. Eli favored his sons, it says, above God. There was this passage that said, Why do you honor your sons more than me? whoa, right? Eli the priest was about more about the business of his kids than about the business of the things of God. Parents, check yourself, right? You have to check yourself, right? Or else you fall into the trap of what? The first two commandments of the Bible. You've fallen into idolatry, right? Your kids have become the idol. Hmm. This is, I I must say, a downfall for a lot of us parents, right? Where we can't seem to put God above even our own kids, right? Our kids become everything. And it is a a very, um, a danger, but yet seems like it's not. And so it's easy to fall into, you know, like most areas, right? It seems so fine, but, you know, you get into it and you mess up. Um, but here Eli does this. And so it says, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do something to make everybody's ear tingle. God says, I'm going to do something that's going to get everybody's attention here. You know, I'm going to pull on everybody's ears. And, um, I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin that he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for for by the sacrifice or offering. Now, I think of a New Testament passage when I read this narrative, and it's one found in the book of Timothy, and it's talking about elders. And it talks about them, they need to be those that rule their own house well in order to, in a sense, rule over the house of God, meaning able to administer in the house of God. And a lot of times we look at that and we go, oh, that means their family's got to be perfect. No, it's that's not what it means. But I think like what could be more of an understanding of the passage is to look at this section in the Bible that Paul the Apostle had. And that is this section in Samuel. Eli wasn't fit to be priest and to administer at the temple. Why? Because he would not restrain his children. And what does that mean? Well, he honored his children more than the things of God. And this is probably where we, where we can see a line being drawn, is that even in New Testament church leadership, you know, which I am a part of, you know, I need to step down if I'm, if I, if I'm more into my kids than into God. If, 
if I can't seem to put the priorities right, then it's probably best for me to get out of that area. You know, I need to always remember that priority. The priority is to serve the Lord. And if I serve the Lord and that's in the right priority, then I am going to love my children right. It doesn't mean they're going to do the right thing. They might not do the right thing, right? But me as a leader need to be able to honor God, right? First and foremost. And then it's through that, that true loving, I'll be able to see clearly to love my children a proper way. That, so that maybe that gives you some insight into that First Timothy chapter 3 section. Yeah, chapter 3 section. Um, <clears throat> so it says, Samuel lay down until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Ooh, get there early to church. Open up those doors, right? <laughs> you know, am I eager? Um, you know, he lay down until morning. He opened up the doors. He's ready to go, ready to see what God's got. You know, I want to be like that, you know, just ready to go. And he was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it that he said to you? Eli asked, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Hmm. This is another thing I need to be aware of. You know, in humans have that we think there's something good in our eyes. Like we see things as like, oh, that's good. That's bad. But Eli really gets it right here where he says, you know what? It's not about what I think's good or right, but it's about what God thinks is good and right. And if God thinks this is right, then it is the right thing to do. And that's, that's something a lot of people aren't ready to give up. We value our autonomy. Um, and sometimes I question if we really do value our autonomy. But I think in general, people do want to value their autonomy. And they go, hey... You know, I'm me, I'm going to do me, you know, you do you, I do me, you know, you know, it's all good. You do yourself, you do this, you know, whatever you want to do, as long as you love people, that kind of idea. And we just think of what is good in our own mind. We have no really basis, no really measuring line of what we're calling really right or wrong. We're just kind of going off of things in our head of what we maybe think at the time of what is good and what is right. But Eli does get it right, man. He goes, hey, God is the ultimate good. God is the ultimate judge. God is perfect in nature, in his, in his being. He's holy. He is whole, separated from us. Um, and he's powerful. So whatever God wants to do, let's kind of go that route, you know. And so uh, Laura says, I was saved at the age of five. I believe we need to teach our children to love God and to serve him even at a young age. Jesus told us to suffer the little children. We are called to come to God as little children. Oh, so true. It's a good, I love that, Laura, that thinking of Samuel is a lot like those little, like thinking of a little child, right? Coming to God, being there, being at the feet of the Ark of the Covenant, being, um, wanting to open up the doors early. Samuel eager. Oh, man. Yeah, that's, that's certainly how we want to be with our Lord Jesus, for sure, right? Just loving him, wanting to be close to him. And so I love that statement of Eli. I think it's really powerful. I think there's some good things in this chapter, for sure, to underline. And Eli said, hey, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. That's right. God, you do what you need to do with me, what's good in your eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. And he let none of his words fall to the ground. Ooh, meaning people listened, right? Uh, people were paying attention to Samuel as he grew up. He grew up in wisdom. Again, very parallel to the narrative of Jesus. And all children from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. Ooh, now we get this idea of prophet. Really the first time we see this coming on the scene, we see Moses being called a prophet and others being called prophetesses, 
uh, women prophets. Uh, we see that already in the Bible. Um, so we see male and female. So for all the people that are interested, yeah, male and female both kind of have this prophetic voice of God. Yet Samuel, um, we, we've had a lot of like space, a lot of time of just nothing, just judges, right? Military judges. And now we have a voice of God, you know, the voice of the Lord, meaning God was giving this revelation to Samuel, speaking to him. Um, and, and it was special. It, it had to do, you know, about the nation, of course, but it, it was really about the will of God. And how cool is that? Um, and so he was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Wow. So as Samuel spoke, God's word was moving through him. Whoa, pretty powerful, right? God breathed. As Samuel spoke, it was as if God was breathing these words through him, breathe, breathing this revelation to the people of Israel. <clears throat> Very cool. Do we need a revelation from God? Yeah, we do. Who is the greatest revelation of God? Jesus. That's right. He is the greatest apostle and high priest of our faith. He is our Messiah, our anointed one. He has come to reveal the Father. He's come to speak the words of the Father. Jesus said everything the Father speaks, I speak. Yeah, so just as Samuel was sharing, right? And it says the Lord there, he revealed himself to Samuel through his word, right? So Jesus, as he speaks, it is the words of the Father, right? It is a, it is the greatest revelation, right? Yeah, a servant has a great revelation of God. Yes, and God uses that servant, but a son, wow. Now that's, the son has greatest, the greatest revelation. So anyway, very cool. Thank you so much for your guys's, um, you know, just updates, uh, kind of information too on things with my mom. I appreciate that for sure. Um, uh, I, I definitely need all that help, but you guys have a good day. Have a great weekend too. Just enjoy uh, the weather and the time. Okay. So God bless you guys. Take care. Bye-bye.